So folks, Tom Lee just dropped a massive bombshell about Palantir. Check it out. This is from his website. Palantir Technologies has now been added as the new granny shot at number one. Now, for those who don't know what this is all about, as you know, in my videos, the bottom line always comes first. And I don't bullshit you to stay on my video. So here's the bottom line first. And then we're going to go through the list. Look, granny shots based on the Tom Lee system is essentially the ones that you can make very, very high percentage wise. Now, the reason it's called a granny shot is nothing with grandmas. Back in the day, there was a free throw shooter. His name was Rick Barry. And he used to shoot basically like grandma, like this from the bottom up instead of the regular shot like this. And he, to this day, one of the best free throw shooters in the NBA. He finished his career with over 90% of free throw makes. So this is why he calls it the granny shot, basically a high percentage investment. And this is the list of his creme de la creme, the best. And Palantir is now on it. We're going to go through it. I'm going to talk to you about why I think he's putting Palantir in that place. And he's not the only one. Now, I should also mention that Palantir was selected as the number one AI machine learning platform by force their wave and that's a huge deal as well the market is starting to recognize that palantir is becoming a dominant force in the market now in my sessions on my patreon account on my community on discord i always say i only invest in companies that will be dominant in the next 10 years i'm not interested in good businesses i'm not interested in things that are going to be nice to have i want the next domination company in my portfolio that's why palantir is in it that's why tesla is in it and that's why Tom Lee is adding it to his new list. Now, this was just added late August, as you can see here on the screen. This is a new addition. But as I'm going to tell you in this video, this is just the start. But first of all, before we get through that, there's a lot to show there. Hold on a second. Let's pull back here a second. Uh, I just want to mention that today is the last day of August. August is finished, finally. Uh, there's no trading on Monday, Labor Day, as you know or should know. Uh, today was a good day for inflation. Today was a good day for micro. Core PC data came out a 2.6%, which is a lot better than the estimated 2.7%. And basically, if you kind of look under the hood, what you find is it's mainly housing that's leading the way at 0.7, I think. Basically, you have to understand that housing A is cyclical, and usually housing peaks in July and August. This is the months where people move. So this is the peak of housing. And number two, it's a lagging indicator. So it takes a while to kind of manifest changes in which the market actually drops prices. So in any case, when it's better than expected and it's housing that's leading, it's a really good news for inflation. And another thing that came out today was the UMich, University of Michigan, shout out, go blue. The one year inflation expectation actually dropped to 2.8%, which is the pretty much the pre-pandemic levels that we've seen for the first time in a long time. So there's definitely more a uh, mandate, leeway, whatever you call it for the Fed to cut rates faster and harder. And we know that they're headed towards 2.8%, which is the neutral rate. And we know it's going to take them about a year to get there. But at this point, with this great inflation data coming up, just reinforcing the conclusion that the Fed will have to move faster. And it seems that despite all the mockery, guys like uh, uh, Jeremy Siegel, who was on TV for six months saying, hey, we need to cut rates, we need to cut rates. This is the time. It seems that he was right because, uh, like Tom Lee said, inflation is dropping like a rock. It just takes some time to identify it if you're very, very centric on the data and the little Excel spreadsheets. But if you look at the big picture, inflation is definitely dropping. It doesn't mean things are getting cheaper. Uh, life is still way more expensive in 2024 than it was in 2020. But it means that the rate at which things are getting more and more expensive is slowing down to a 2% level, which is kind of normal and standard. It's still very expensive to live in the Western world, especially in the US. Now, let's go back to Tom Lee. I want to show this on screen. So Tom Lee added this to his list, and I want to show you what this means. If we scroll down here on his website, you'll find it. By the way, here you can see that housing is literally leading the way with 0.7. Yeah. So uh, this is the explanation of his uh, granny shots. So SMID granny shots represents the best of the best from thematics. The granny shots represents the best of the best small caps and mid caps uh, from the thematic portfolios. This derived from looking at stocks which appear in multiple themes. Basically, he's looking at all possible things that can inf impact the stock. By the way, this is Rick Barry. And as you can see him holding the ball down here, this is how he used to shoot from, from his crouch. And he actually made a very high percentage of free throws, one of the best in history. So that's why this thing is called a granny shot, because it's a very, very high percentage shot. And for a Palantir to be on this list for the first time in a long time, as you can see, Palantir is right here on this uh, right-hand side. It's a huge deal. It's been added right here. And now I want to talk a little bit about uh, this whole Palantir thing. And, and why I think it's a it's a huge deal. You see, uh, with Palantir uh, being added to this list, 
it's another kind of indication that the market is starting to realize what Palantir is and what Palantir isn't, right? If you recall back in December of 2022, when um, Palantir was at $6, $7, and everybody was saying, well, it's a horrible stock. Uh, you know, Tom, they're not profitable. You know, the CEO is uh, crazy. What do they even do? We don't understand their business. It's not like a Tesla. You can drive a Tesla. You can't drive a Palantir product and so forth and so forth. Many videos have been made uh, by people for a lot of cloud saying that, you know, I'm an idiot for believing in the stock. Many people who have been bulls sold it, made videos about that, how they sold it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, right now we're up 124% over the past 12 months. We have beaten the S&P 500 by 96%. Uh, all I've done from that $6 price point until now is keep my mouth shut and DCA as hard as I can when the stock was below the 52-week high. I am still buying actively Palantir right now, but because it's currently not below the 52-week high by 20%, I'm buying normally. That's the only thing I've done since 2020, and nothing has changed. Now, uh, at the end of the day, for people who are not familiar with, with Palantir, I just want to kind of summarize why Palantir is such a granny shot, like Tom Lee is pointing out. And, and Tom Lee is right about this. Look, it, there's he just added it, I believe, uh, on August 20th, right? Let's look at it. Yeah, it was added on August 20th. So it's a recent ad, but let me tell you why I think he added it. Look, at the end of the day, uh, Palantir, as it was kind of named in the Forrester Wave selection as the number one AI machine learning platform, Palantir kind of become the quasi-monopoly of the AI operational software kind of uh, world. Because at the end of the day, you have the AI world divided into two kind of categories, right? You have one category, which is the LLMs, the generative AI. People are trying to generate information, generate business with, with AI by large language models. On the other hand, you have the infrastructure plays like NVIDIA, like AMD, like Dill, who are basically like SMCI, right? On the infrastructure side, essentially trying to build the infrastructure to run all this new business on. But think about it this way. What Palantir has is neither. They're not an infrastructure play. And they're not an LLM. What they are essentially is Windows. When you have a great machine uh, and you have great software that can run on this machine, you still need an operating system to operate the machine and have it communicate with the software you just bought, right? If you want a great video game and you have a great computer, you still need an operating system. You need a Windows. And Palantir AIP is essentially that Windows. Uh, to keep it simple, because I'm not a technical guy. I'm not one of them people who you know understands the nuts and bolts of how this thing works, but I understand enough. Now, the one thing I know is numbers, and numbers is my game. Look, since the company went public in 2020, the government business has doubled from 600 million a year to 1.2 billion a year. Not bad. The commercial sector has gone from 500 million per year to 1 billion per year. So government business doubled, commercial business doubled, all in four years. And one of the main criticisms that was about Palantir is that, look, Palantir is, is a US-centric company they can't expand outside the U.S. because they're so anti, uh, you know, anti uh, uh, all of this, you know, pro-U.S. stuff and the, the, the anti-China, anti-Russia. Look, the rest of the world business for Palantir has doubled over the past four years from 300 million to 600 million. So they've doubled the rest of the world reach even without selling to China and Russia. I guess you can make money without selling your soul to the enemies of America. <laughs> and that's what Palantir has been saying. It's one of their main reasons I like this stock because they've never given up on their on their principles to make extra dollars. They've never sold their soul to the devil and I absolutely love that. And I believe long-term, it's gonna reward them. It's already starting to happen. Now, I personally spoke, and that, that's something that I get to do on this channel because um, I'm not a regular retail investor, uh, but I'm also, you know, I don't think I'm Hollywood, but because I have this channel, people reach out to me and they wanna to talk to me. And that's why I have a lot of access to a lot of interesting people. I've spoken to people who use this platform, who are clients, I've spoken to big clients, to small clients, to secondary clients. I've spoken to a lot of people who use Palantir products. And the amount of times I heard this sentence come out of clients' mouths was, hey, Palantir really saved their ass. We were in a trouble spot, impossible to recover from, and Palantir came in and saved us. I heard that from people who talked about what they did to Airbus with the A350. I heard it about some shipping companies they work with. I heard about some airlines they work with, completely unrelated businesses. I heard from a lot of customers the same thing. And the same customers also told me, ever since we started working with Palantir and I saw what this platform does, 
I've become the biggest Palantir shareholder on the planet. I'm buying Palantir stock as much as I can because I've seen what the platform can do. I heard from soldiers who told me, hey, Palantir saved, our, saved their ass on the battlefield multiple times. I haven't heard anybody say anything else about the software and this platform. So the one thing I know is even if you don't have access to all these great people, all these clients like I do, go watch the latest AIP con by Palantir, which was uh, uh, hosted uh, by, by Alex Karp and Amit was there. He did a great panel. But look at the Palantir AIP con and you'll hear CEOs of massive companies talk to you and explain to you in very simple terms how AIP, the Palantir software, the platform, converted decisions that took weeks to make into seconds. Because at the end of the day, something that used to take weeks by going back and forth and emails and approvals and decision making and somebody had to sign off and bureaucracy, now it happens seamlessly inside the system with AIP. Now, AIP takes these LLM models and instead of having kind of a chatbot <laughs> and kind of a textual answers to questions, it turns it into operational decision-making mechanisms that basically uh, expedite and accelerate everything that's happening in your organization. In fact, right now we've gone to the point where if you don't have AIP, you're handicapping your company versus the competition. And that's why the AIP cons are oversubscribed. There's not enough seats and Palantir simply doesn't have enough capacity to supply all this demand. While everybody talks about the fact that, oh, NVIDIA can't supply all this massive demand, which is true, Palantir also still can't supply all this demand, but nobody's talking about it because NVIDIA is the big news. But Palantir has clients banging on its doors and it has limited capacity and they can do as much as they can do. The only thing that's stopping Palantir from getting to 50, 60, 70 percent growth per year, which they will, is their own ability to supply more of this stuff. It's the only thing. They have enough clients to go for five years forward at 50, 60 percent growth. So at the end of the day, if you look at the, at the company, you say, well, you know, Tom, customer growth over the past year was only 41%. Well, number one, show me a company that has 41% customer growth in a year, and I'll show you a great company. But that's not even the point. The point is that 41% is constrained by Palantir's own ability to take on extra customers. It's not about the, the ability of the market to, to generate the demand. There's plenty of demand. Uh, now, if you look at the data analytics market, According to all estimates, by 2032, this market is going to be worth 500 to 600 billion dollars. Right now, it's worth one tenth of that, about 50 billion dollars. So the entire market is going to go into a 10x mode. That's not me saying it. That's data. Sam Altman says it might even be much, much bigger. But let's say it's going to 10x. So if the entire TAM is going to 10x, and if Palantir is the quasi-monopoly in operating system, and everybody else is beefing about, oh, who has the best LLM? LLMs are becoming commoditized. NVIDIA is taking over the infrastructure. And in the software, the same thing is happening with Palantir, but it's happening under the radar. And very few people are noticing that this thing is going to be the next NVIDIA. Well, now you have Tom Lee noticing, which is good. Now you have uh, Forrester Wave noticing, that's good. A lot of people are starting to notice, but still, it's still under the radar. Uh, the current valuation of about $70 billion is nowhere near where it's going to be. In fact, my own estimates for this company are pretty insane. I don't want to scare people, but uh, I have here some numbers and I want to show you. So I'm going to pull this from the screen and I'm going to show you my numbers. So my five year, uh, you know what? Let's pull up Stock MVP because on Stock MVP, you have all this data and I don't have to, because uh, I hate talking without showing data. Uh, to me, it, it kind of, uh, I, I need transparency. So I want to show you stuff. So let's pull it up on the screen right now. So Palantir is on the screen. I'm going to pull it up and then we go through the data together and I'll show you my price target. Okay. Okay, so Palantir at this point, look, the one thing about Palantir, I think you guys need to understand is that while most companies, when they're growing, right, they're generating more revenue and more revenue, the cost to operate the company go up. It's normal. You, know, you, you need to burn money to make money, right? So every company that has more and more revenue, the, the costs are going up. But with Palantir, it's quite the opposite. If you look at the screen right now, what you see is that while revenue went up by 86% of the past year, which is insane, R&D expenses went down by 30%. Operating expenses went down by 22%. And net income went up by more than the revenue by 132%. So this company is growing at 90%. The expenses are dropping at 30%. And the net income is rising by 132%, which essentially means that it's becoming more and more. So I have to close this call. It, it has to, you know, it's more and more efficient with every uh, minute goes by. 
Now, uh, look at the stuff I'm going to show you right now here in the screen. So uh, cash and cash equivalents are $4 billion. Total debt is $260 million. I mean, it's hard to find a company with that much cash and that little debt, which is operating at these margins and is growing that fast and is so efficient. Now, my price target for Palantir, I'm going to kind of call it out and you guys can do whatever you want with it. I'm not going to get laughed out of the building, don't worry. So my bear case for the next five years is $75. So at, very, at the minimum, uh, this stock is going to double in five years at the very minimum. My medium case is $152. And my bull case valuation for the next five years is $230. I believe Palantir in five years will be at $230. And if people ask you, oh, Tom, when is that 500 coming? It's coming. Don't worry. It's coming. It's coming faster than you think. I'll see you in the next one.